This is my new Spider-Man mask with moving lenses. You know what's crazy? I've made so many things on this channel from different masks and helmets and weapons and armor. But the crazy thing is, I've never 3D printed anything. No 3D printer. This wasn't 3D print. I did not use a 3D print. Did not involve any 3D print. No 3D printer, no power tools or anything like so, that. So, like, what's the deal? What do I have against 3D printing? Well, nothing really. It's just that ever since I was a kid, I've always loved building stuff with my hands. Cardboard, foam, resin, super glue, duct tape. I guess what I'm trying to say is I've never felt the need to get into 3D printing because I just enjoy the feeling of building something out of nothing. It's been my hobby forever. While 3D printing can't completely replace this hobby, these days 3D printing has become so ridiculously easy and accessible that at this point it's hard to ignore. So now kind of feels like the perfect time to start getting into it. And what better way to start than to 3D print a Spider-Man mask with moving lenses. First things first, we need a 3D printer. Okay, Bamboo Lab just sent us their A1 3D printer. Honestly, I would've just bought this with my own money. Don't tell them I said that. Oh, you thought this was the printer? No, 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 that's the printer. Then what's in this box? Okay, I think this is filament. That's, wow, that is a lot of filament. These bamboo filaments have RFID tags inside, which tells the printer exactly what settings to use. Not only is this bamboo printer so smart and automated, it's also incredibly easy to set up. The assembly video on YouTube is great if you're like me and you don't like reading manuals. Now, my dad actually gifted me my first 3D printer almost 10 years ago, but I couldn't get a single successful print on it, so I just gave up. This printer is the opposite. You just plug it in and it literally works. All right, enough yapping. Let's get to work. I'll download Bamboo Studio, which is the slicer I'm gonna use. And of course, we need a 3D model. I decided to purchase this one made by Cool Helmet Studio on Etsy, which I'll leave a link to below. Once we have our 3D model, we can open Bamboo Studio and create a new project. There's quite a few folders in here, but let's just start with the face shell. Since my head is kind of small, I used this scale button to resize everything to 95%. From here, we can change the orientation of the print. You can go upright, upside down, sideways, whatever works for you, but this orientation worked for me. Over here, we specify what printer we're using, and down here, these four colors represent the four spools on the AMS. I can press 4 if I want the the whole model to be red and furthermore, I can even use this tool to assign different colors to individual sections. Only the eyes will be visible in the final product, so you could print in all black, but I used some red so it's easier for you to see what I'm doing on camera. For the layer height, 0.28 is good enough in this case. Let's enable supports, and if you click preview, it'll show you exactly how long the print will take. Before printing, we just need to make sure that the right color is assigned to the right slot. In my case, black is on A1 and red is on A4. Now we're ready to print and we can let the machine work its magic. This thing is smooth as butter. This looks really good and it fits great too. If you remember, we scaled down to 95%. Uh, now, the creator of this 3D file strongly recommends that you don't change the scale. Otherwise, the tolerances of all the moving parts gets all thrown off. But I have some workarounds in mind, which I'll show you throughout this video. I bought some M3 screws on Amazon and I'm gonna cut the head off with a pair of wire cutters. These are gonna go right here inside those two holes. But before that, I just need to make a little more room for the screws to fit, especially since we scaled down the file. Next, we need to thread the hole, but at the time of recording, this I didn't have an M3 tap bit on hand so I just manually threaded the hole with the screw itself which wasn't ideal but it seemed like it worked out fine anyway. I carefully screwed these on with pliers and these screws are what the moving lenses are going to hinge on. A little super glue will keep these locked in and we can move on to the next step. Since the moving shutters are going to be visible in the final product, I printed them with a 0.08mm layer height, but unless I mention otherwise, everything else was just done at 0.28mm, which is good enough. I had to drill these holes a little larger to compensate for scaling down to 95%, but once that's all sorted out, we'll use a little bit of heat from a heat gun to soften those shutter pieces and make them conform to the curve of the face shell. These tiny orange pieces here are designed to snap together with these little green pieces. If they don't fit, however, it could be due to slight limitations in your printer's ability to print fine details. In any case, the 3D modeler actually included a few size variations of those green pieces, so you can just test them out and use the one that fits best. A little drop of super glue is all that's needed to keep this orange piece intact, and basically that orange piece is going to get dragged by the piece that's on top of it so that from the front you see multiple layers of shutters. Now we'll snap on that green piece which just prevents the orange piece from sliding underneath. Now there's a specific order that the shutter pieces need to be stacked in so this bottom shutter goes in between the two top shutters and then this remaining bottom shutter goes last like this. Once all the holes are lined up we can slide this whole thing onto the screw and then cap it off with an M3 nut. 
I probably should have used a longer screw for this nut, but it worked out anyway. The frames for the eyes were printed with a 0.08mm layer height just to try to get a little more detail. Just like we did with the shutter pieces, I heated these up until they became malleable and pressed it onto the mask. Once the plastic cools down, it stays curved, and from here, I'm going to temporarily hot glue these onto the mask until I add the fabric. These are all the moving parts that will make the eyes open and close. Of course, these pieces of plastic aren't just going to move by themselves, so that's where these little MG90S servos come into play. These servos come included with little screws, and make sure to set those aside for later because we'll be needing them. Taking a look at this servo, you'll notice that it doesn't really fit properly in this green piece like it's supposed to, and that's because we shrunk everything down to 95%. So what we're going to have to do is shave these walls down with some sandpaper to make the gap large enough to allow this servo to fit in here. Low key, I underestimated how much sanding I would need to do. If I were to do this over again, I would probably use a Dremel with a little burbit and that would probably get the job done a lot faster. Anyways, eventually I was able to get the servo to fit, which is all that matters in the end. Let's set this aside and we can work on the next thing. These orange pieces should be able to slide freely like this, but if they don't, just sand them down a little bit. Luckily, my A1 printer is super crispy and accurate, so I didn't really have to sand anything. Once again, because we scaled everything down to 95%, we have to compensate by making this hole a little larger. Afterwards, we can take the screw that came with the servo, feed that through the hole, and then screw this thing in between the two orange pieces. You want to leave a little wiggle room, that way this green piece can spin freely, which will allow the orange pieces to kind of teeter-totter like this. Well, my M3 tap bit eventually came in the mail, so now I can can put it to good use. When threading, I'm careful not to drill too fast or else the plastic will melt, especially since I'm using PLA. Once those holes were threaded, I switched to an eighth inch drill bit and drilled all the holes on these three arm pieces. Here I'm using the exact same M3 screws we used earlier and I make sure to leave a little wiggle room so that these can rotate freely like this. By the way, this gray piece here is going to be ever so slightly visible through the white mesh eyes, so ideally you should print this in a lighter filament like white or gray or clear. As you can see, I added some M3 washers and M3 screws, and now we're ready to install this whole contraption inside the mask. The holes for the screws are already on the mask, we just need to thread them using the same M3 tap bit we used earlier, and you may or may not need to reposition this later on, so no need to screw this on too tight for now. For these three little pieces here, we simply lined them up with the holes on the shutter pieces and super glued those in place. Those little circle pieces are what we're going to use to attach the arms to the shutters. We don't have to screw these on tight or anything, just need to make sure that each arm is securely attached to its respective shutter piece. And there we have it. Now the eyes can open and close. Even though we're far from done this mask, getting to this point feels really rewarding and seeing this mechanism in action is super satisfying. At this point, you should check to see what it looks like from the front and you can always unscrew and reposition that green piece if it looks slightly misaligned from the front. Again, because we scaled everything down to 95%, I noticed another small flaw, which is that the washer interferes with the servo. But that was a really easy fix, I just shaved off a portion of the washer to allow enough clearance for the servo. Now that that's out of the way, we can move on to the electronics. So, in order to make the eyes move, we need a couple things. We need the servos, which I showed you before, and we need a microcontroller. Now the servo is the part that actually moves, it has a little wheel that can rotate. Whereas the microcontroller is like the brain. It tells the servo when to move, how fast to move, how many degrees to move, that kind of thing. This microcontroller is called the Alicia MKE Mini made by Crashworks 3D. And it comes included with these cables you see here. The beauty of this Alicia MKE Mini is that you don't even have to code anything. It just comes preloaded with code, so anyone can do this. It's really easy. That said, you do have the option to edit the code if you want to. Like, for example, let's say you want the servos to rotate 135 degrees instead of 125 degrees which is the default. In that case, just go to their website, click this upload button, and there you'll find more information. And it should be pretty easy to edit, actually. As you can see, there's a couple loose wires just chilling out in the open, so we're going to do some simple soldering. This limit switch is what's going to trigger the eyes to move. Notice there's C, N, O, and N, C but we're going to solder the two blue wires to C and NO. It doesn't matter which wire goes to which terminal as long as one goes to C and one goes to NO. This other switch will allow us to turn everything on and off and we'll solder the red wire to one of those two terminals. It doesn't really matter which one. Before soldering, remember to slide some shrink tubing onto the wires. Then let's add flux, add solder, then add a little more flux, and finally join the wire to the pad. Some of these soldering joints were absolutely hideous, but I guess if it works, it works. After soldering, it's just a matter of adding the heat shrink tubing and done. By the way, I'll leave links below to these tools and products I used in case you want to check those out. Taking a look at our circuit, we still have this black wire exposed right here. So what we have to do with that is solder a USB-C cable to it. 
I used a wire stripper to expose the bare metal, then twisted the two black wires together before soldering them. The very last thing we have to solder is the red wire of the USB-C cable to the remaining terminal on the rocker switch. And once that's done, we can complete the circuit by adding a battery. This here is a 5 volt 1 amp rechargeable power bank. It's literally the tiniest 5 volt 1 amp power bank I could find. This power bank seems to be sold out on Amazon, but I'll see if I can find another seller to link in the description for you. Once it's turned on, you can press the limit switch and the servos should move. In order to allow the battery to fit more compactly into the mask, I took apart the casing or the housing, whatever you want to call it. And after doing this, it's a good idea to add some hot glue to the solder joints because they're very, very fragile and prone to breaking. I kind of learned that the hard way when they broke and I had to re-solder the joints back. Anyway, at this point, I started gluing the electronics inside the face shell. And while I was at it, I put a little popsicle stick on the limit switch so that I can press the button with my mouth to trigger the servos. Speaking of servos, these orange gears are supposed to be able to slide onto the servo, but we'll need to drill a slightly bigger hole to once again compensate for changing the scale. Now don't just slide the orange gear onto the servo right away, instead what you should do is make sure the servo is in the open position and that the lenses are all the way open as well, and then line up the gear teeth with the servo so that they all mesh properly, and once everything's aligned, then you can slide the gear onto the servo. Keep in mind that each servo is specific to one side based on the direction it rotates. One is meant for the left eye and the other for the right. Okay, and now we can give it a little test spin. Just for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna hot glue the servos into the mask. This is just temporary so that I can quickly explain to you what all the button controls do and how to control the eyes. A single press makes the eyes blink. Holding down on the button makes the eyes stay shut. Then as soon as you let go, it opens back up. A double press makes the eyes close partially, but not all the way. Then double tap again to open. Triple tap makes the left eye wink and quadruple tap makes the right eye wink. Now I owe Crashworks 3D a huge thanks because they did both me and you a huge favor. Um, let me explain. Basically all those features I just showed you like the double tap and triple tap and all that stuff, that's not what this board was originally designed to do. Um, originally this board was meant to motorize Iron Man helmets. So none of those button tap features were programmed in there initially. But I was talking to the guy on Discord, who the guy who makes these boards and uh, he, heard that I was making a Spider-Man mask and was like, oh, I'll just reprogram everything and add a few extra features for your Spider-Man mask, which is awesome. So shout out to him. If you're gonna buy this Alicia MKE Mini and you want this exact version that I'm holding, then make sure when you check out, you click add note to seller and just type upload Spider-Man code. And that way the seller knows that you want this version of the board and not the other one. This LED light on my power bank is surprisingly bright and shows through the front even with the fabric on top. So I covered it up with some tape. Also, just a heads up before I forget, there's a dedicated Discord thread for troubleshooting Crashworks boards. It's a super helpful resource, so I'll drop a link below. Believe it or not, we still have more stuff to print. Never mind this for now, cause uh, it's graduation season. I have less than two hours before I'm attending my cousin's graduation. I'm gonna print him a gag gift cause uh, I kinda wanna troll him. Let's open up the Bamboo Handy app. This app literally has thousands of free models that you can just print with one click. It's actually pretty crazy. So let's go up here to the search bar, silly trophy. And let's see here. I think I like this one right here. Click this big green button, start print, and it's that easy. As you can see, we're printing in more than one color at once. And that's all thanks to the AMS, which allows you to print up to four colors at once. I have something for you. Yeah. Now this A1 printer and this AMS light can be sold separately or you can buy them together as a combo. Honestly, for the money, I haven't seen any better printers out there. If you know of a better printer that exists right now for the same price, then let me know because I haven't seen any. That said, if you're looking to print more advanced materials like ABS or ASA, then Bamboo Lab also offers this P1S, which is a very competitively priced 3D printer for what it offers. If you're interested in buying a Bamboo Lab printer, then check out the link below. Bamboo Lab is currently running a discount on their printers with up to 40% off, so it's actually a really good time to get a bamboo printer. I traced and cut out the shape of that orange template onto a piece of transparent warbler. If you're not familiar with this material, it's basically a type of plastic that becomes malleable when you heat it with a heat gun. I added a slight curve to this piece so that it fits inside the mask a bit more naturally. And see how there's a bit of overlap with this green piece here? Well, I'm not even sure if this is necessary, but I decided to trim down the plastic a little just in case the two pieces bump into each other. Just a quick note about the electronics. So if you're using that Crashworks 3D board I showed earlier, your servos will rotate 125 degrees by default. 
Now, remember, I scaled my 3D printed parts down to 95%, but if, for example, you print at like 100%, then optionally, you could edit the code to make your servos rotate more to compensate for the size difference. From what I understand, the original creator made his servos rotate 143 degrees, so in theory, I think I could have made my servos rotate like 135 degrees, but during my testing, I found that 135 degrees was putting like strain on the servos, especially with the added friction of these white pieces. That's just my anecdotal experience though, so do with that information what you will. These are the very last things we need to print for this mask. These three pegs right here, they won't be able to fit over top of the servo like they're supposed to, which is just another consequence of scaling all the files down to 95%. But no big deal, I'll just remove some of the material with a cheap throwaway soldering iron until there's enough clearance. Also, we should enlarge these holes here, which need to be able to accommodate the same M3 screws we've been using throughout this build. Let's go ahead and thread the holes, and make sure to screw this plate down very firmly because the gear teeth need to stay tightly pressed together so they don't slip out of alignment when the servo moves the lenses. For the fabric, I printed this pattern using the poster format in Adobe Acrobat Reader. I found this pattern online from Alex Cherva and I turned it into a PDF which I'll link below. Just for reference, I printed that PDF at 100% scale, but in hindsight, I think I should have printed this actually a little bit smaller, but I'll talk more about that later. In case it's not already obvious, the look I'm going for is from the suit in the final scene of No Way Home. The template I'm using is a little bit of an older one from an older suit, but as far as I'm concerned, it's close enough and it'll do the job just fine. Now we'll take some red stretchy fabric and give it a texture that's similar to the real suit. So I used a squeegee to push puff paint through the holes of this perforated vinyl. After this paint dries, you can line up a brand new sheet of perforated vinyl over top of those existing dots and do a second layer of paint if you want to make the dots pop even more. Honestly, it turned out to be really tedious to try to line up those holes with the vinyl, but if you're willing to take your time with it, the results can actually actually be surprisingly really good and look almost screen printed. I didn't show you here, but I admit I rushed a lot of areas of my mask when doing this step, and it definitely shows in the final product. But if you're willing to take your time, trust me, you can actually get really good results with this technique. You know what you can't get good results with though? Puff painting the web lines. Okay, well, I'm half joking. Yes, you can get decent results using puff paint for the web lines, but man, I tell you, I've puff painted quite a few Spider-Man masks in my life, and every single time I tell myself the exact same thing. I tell myself I'm gonna lock in and just try to do the most perfect, best puff paint job ever, and then I get disappointed every single time because puff paint has its limitations. Puff paint can still look great, don't get me wrong, but I swear there has to be someone out there that relates to what I'm saying. I think the natural next step for me in the future is maybe to try screen printing. Taking a look at the paper pattern, these lines right here are actually just a duplicate of these lines right here, so no need to do them twice. Right here is where I'm going to sew first. I used a zigzag stitch with a stitch length of around 1.75 and a stitch width of around 2. I also used a stretch needle because, uh, well, I mean I asked ChatGPT because I'm not a sewing expert and that's what it said I should use, so if you know a lot about sewing, let me know if this is right. On the back of the fabric, I drew a line indicating where the web line is so that I could sew right up against that web line and make the seam look more hidden. Next I'll sew this edge to this edge and this edge to this edge. And we're also going to sew an invisible zipper at the very back of the mask where these edges are right here. The invisible zipper will look like this at first, but you actually need to fold the teeth outwards like this and press it down with an iron. I switched to a straight stitch with a stitch length of 3 and also switched to an invisible zipper foot before sewing that invisible zipper. Once all the sewing is complete, we can slide the fabric over the face shell and carefully cut out the eye holes. I probably should have made the fabric mask like maybe 5-ish percent smaller because as you can see, there's a ton of wrinkles. I think what I'm gonna have to do is just rip all the seams out with a seam ripper and then just sew everything a little bit tighter and hopefully that'll get most of the wrinkles out. After I got that all sorted out, it was just a matter of super gluing the lens frames from earlier back onto the mask. And that is how you 3D print a Spider-Man mask with moving lenses. I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Um, there's definitely room for improvement, but for what it is, I'm happy with it. And uh, I'm optimistic that we can improve on this design in the future because if you've been with me since COVID, then you know that 
we've definitely come a long way from where we started. By the way, one last thing. Bamboo Lab is currently giving away a bunch of free printers and a shot at a $100,000 prize pool. For a chance to win, just share your best 3D printing moment with the hashtag Bamboo Let's Make It and submit it on their website. Links below if you're interested. And finally, click here if you want to watch me make a Wolverine mask. Thank you very much to my patrons for supporting me on Patreon, and thank you for watching.